Thanks, Al. Good afternoon. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, my purpose this afternoon is to talk about the uh, financial crisis. I'll have to admit I wish I had a more fun subject, but it is a very important subject. Not because of the economic consequences as much as because of the long-term policy considerations. Um, four basic themes. Um, the financial crisis which we have recently uh, experienced is primarily caused by government policy. We do not live in a free market in the United States. We live in a mixed economy. That mixture varies a lot by industry. Technology is probably 20% government, 80% free. Financial services is probably 70% government, 30% free. It is not surprising that the most regulated industries where we had our most significant problems. Government policy, secondarily, resulted in a bubble in the residential real estate market. That bubble deflated, as all bubbles do, got transmitted into the capital markets, destroyed trillions of dollars of wealth, and ultimately into the economic system in general, destroying millions of jobs. Thirdly, a number of financial institutions, Wall Street firms, made some very serious mistakes. If I had been in charge, I'd let those companies go out of business. However, those mistakes were secondary compared to government policy. And finally, and in some ways most significantly, almost everything we've done since this crisis started even things that may be of some benefit in the short term will almost certainly reduce our standard of living in the long term. What happened? We built over a trillion dollars too much residential real estate. We built too many houses, we built too big of houses, we built houses in the wrong place. We should have been investing in technology, manufacturing capacity, education, agriculture. We should have saved more, spent less. How did we make an error of that magnitude? The magnitude of the error suggests that it came from government policy because private firms can hardly drive that kind of mistake. And the three primary culprits of the Federal Reserve, uh, the FDIC and government housing policy, specifically Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the giant government-sponsored enterprises. The uh, fundamental cause of the problem was the Federal Reserve. It's something that many of you may know, or at least you learned uh, while you were in, uh, studying uh, in, in, a, in university, is that the Federal Reserve System in the United States owns the monetary system. We do not have a private monetary system. In 1913, the monetary system in the United States was nationalized. Uh, if we're having problems in the monetary system, by definition, they have to be government policy problems. It would be like if interstate highway bridges were falling down. Everybody said, well, the government owns the roads, highway bridges are falling down. The government owns the monetary system. The Federal Reserve, was, in theory, was created to reduce volatility in the economy. In fact, what they do is reduce volatility in the short term and they increase volatility in the long term. In a free market, because we're not omniscient, markets are constantly correcting. Businesses are being created, businesses are failing. If you take out the downside of the correction process, if you keep businesses from failing, what you do is push the problems into the future. In fact, the Federal Reserve itself will admit it was one of the main causes of the Great Depression. The very existence of the Federal Reserve creates a major leverage problem in our economic system. States can borrow a lot of money because they have the taxing authority, but ultimately they hit a limit. California's probably hit that limit. Uh, the federal government can not only borrow money because they have taxing authority, but because they can print money. When you have that temptation with Congress, they tend to borrow a lot. And the very existence of the Federal Reserve has taken away the discipline that would have occurred if they, if they couldn't print money. In addition, unfortunately, um, in, in really beginning 10 or 15 years ago, the Federal Reserve made a series of mistakes, primarily driven by a desire of Alan Greenspan to be the hero and for us never to have an economic correction. In the early 2000s, he made some very significant mistakes and he created what's called negative real interest rates. And that meant inflation was about uh, 3% and you could borrow money at 2%. You cannot create a bigger incentive to borrow. And then Bernanke made things worse by inverting the yield curve. An inverted yield curve is where short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. That's not a natural phenomenon. Markets never invert yield curves. Only the, Fed, uh, the, the Federal Reserve can invert the yield curve. What that did is that banks borrow short and lend long. That meant that bank margins went negative. Banks were buying watermelons for $10 and selling them for $8. The only thing they could do to make a profit was go out on the risk spectrum where they got higher returns. Most of the really bad loans were made during that inverted yield curve period. And at the same time, Bernanke was telling the world that that wasn't going to create economic problems. He did not predict this recession. Nobody in the Fed predicted any kind of recession, much less the recession that we had. The problem with the Federal Reserve is interesting. They have very smart people. They have very advanced mathematical models. 
However, nobody, I don't care how smart you are or how good your models are, can integrate the economic activity of seven billion people on this planet. It's simply not doable. We simply had a massive increase in a, in a, in a sense in, in, in the availability of credit and money provided by the Federal Reserve, which, which created the bubble. Second problem was the FDIC. FDIC insurance sounds good, right? What it does, however, is it destroys market discipline. We saw that in our business. <clears throat> One of the markets we operate in is Atlanta, Georgia. And we took over a failed bank in Atlanta, Georgia. It was a very typical situation. Ten guys that had been in the motel business got together. They raised a little bit of capital. They leveraged it up a lot, buying high, uh, paying high rates for certificates of deposit. They lent that money to their cronies in the motel business. Those motels went broke, and the FDIC lost 50 cents on the dollar. On a bigger scale, Washington Mutual, Golden West, Indy Mac, all large financial institutions that fail, finance high-risk lending businesses using uh, FDIC insurance because a typical depositor didn't care how financially sound Golden West was because they had the government insurance program through the FDIC. Big misallocation of capital. The proximate cause of the, of the financial crisis was government housing policy. Now this goes back a long time where the government has tried to incent home ownership above what's called the natural market rate under the theory that owning a home is a good thing. Well, the actual, it's almost the reverse. People that have discipline to buy homes tend to be better disciplined people. However, incenting people to buy houses per se does not naturally change human behavior. And encouraging people to buy houses they can't afford is obviously not a good thing. Um, tax policy is certainly incented residential ownership. The Community Reinvestment Act night, back in the 1970s started us down that path. But the big event happened in, in September of 1999, and I was CEO of Burn BBT, and I remember this, and it really said, wow, this is a really risky event. And that was a decision by Bill Clinton that required Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, these giant government-sponsored enterprises, to have at least half their loan portfolio in so-called affordable housing, now subprime lending. And a number of economists, by the way, including liberal economists, said, wow, this is risky. The legitimate affordable housing market is not that big. And if Freddie and Fannie reach this goal, they could fail. And they're so big, if they fail, they're going to take out the United States economic system, and it could happen in 10 years. Nine years later, it happened. When Freddie and Fannie failed, they owed $5 trillion. And remember, a, a trillion is a million million. That's a big number. Uh, they never would have existed in the free market. The only way they exist is the government guaranteed their debts. Now those debts are yours. Congratulations. Uh, uh, even before they failed, they were leveraged 1,000 to 1. They had $1,000 of debt to every dollar for equity. I personally participated in the committee from the Financial Services Roundtable, the 100 largest banks, uh, for a nine-year period trying to do something about Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. We met with Congress on numerous occasions. We were running the numbers, and it was mathematically certain they were going to fail. Anybody in this room, a 15-year-old, would have said they would, would fail. And, and Congress absolutely refused to do anything about it. And the evil one, in my view, was Barney Frank, because he was one of the few guys that was smart enough to know what was going on and still wouldn't do anything about it. Well, why, why would they not act? Two basic reasons. One, there was a religious belief in affordable housing. It was, it was like some of the environmentalist belief. It was very, very emotional belief in affordable housing. And then secondly, Freddie and Fannie were the single biggest contributors to the Democratic Party and huge contributors to the Republican Party. So they, they watched Freddie and Fannie fail. In a very simple <coughs> uh, sense, we had a bubble because the Federal Reserve printed too much money, and it ended up in the housing market because of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. There's a couple of ripples that came out of that. Probably one of the products that was very destructive is one <clears throat> you've heard about called the pick-a-payment mortgages or the negative amortization mortgages. In a pick-a-payment mortgage, for example, an individual would, go, would buy a house, and their interest would be $1,000 a month, but all they had to pay was $500 a month. So each month they owed more on their loan. So at the end of five years, they owed a lot more than they borrowed. Great product, right? Very popular in fast growth markets like Southern California, Southern Florida, Metro DC. Uh, very po a popular product. Interesting enough, guess who made the pick of paper mortgages? <laughs> Washington Mutual, Golden West, Indy Mac, who all funded that high risk loan portfolio with FDIC deposits. They built branches all over the country, bought certificates of deposit, paying above market rates. They never could have funded that business without FDIC insurance. BB&T uh, chose not to get into the pick-a-payment mortgage business for an interesting reason, a non-economic reason, and I'll come back and draw a circle around this, uh, because we thought that we would be doing a terrible disservice to our clients. One of the fundamental commitments in our mission is to help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. 
Uh, we expect to make a profit doing that, but we absolutely never, ever want to do anything that's bad for our clients. We did not see the crash in the real estate market, but we knew that this product was very dangerous, that we'd be encouraging a lot of young people in particular, who most of the ones that got this product, to, to set themselves up for huge financial risk. And five years down the road, they could be in trouble. And even though we could sell the product and theoretically have, have not taken any risk, we didn't want to do the wrong things for our for our clients. So over ethics, we chose not to offer that kind of product. And I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Um, another interesting thing, and this is ha it's very relevant to what's happening today. Many government policies have long-term unintended consequences. And here's one of the interesting questions. How did Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae end up dominating the home mortgage business? Why, are they, why did they dominate the home mortgage business? When I got my first mortgage, and a few of you are probably in my age group, Back in, in the early 1970s, I went down to a local savings and loan association, and I got an 80% mortgage. I put 20% down. It was a 30-year mortgage, and it was a fixed rate. 95% of the people in America went down to their local savings and loan and got a fixed rate home mortgage. What happened to the savings and loan industry? That, interesting enough, they were systematically destroyed by government policy. And it started with Lyndon Baines Johnson. He wanted to have the Great Society, uh, and he also wanted to have the Vietnam War. But he didn't want to pay for it with taxes, because that's not very popular, sound like today. So what did they do? The Federal Reserve financed that huge expansion in the economic system, led to inflation in the 1970s that kind of got out of control. In the early 1980s, Reagan bought that under control, but he did it by driving interest rates. The prime rate went up over 20%. These savings and loans have been making 8% fixed rate mortgages. They've been doing it for 70 years. They had very low losses because they, when they made the loans, they cared about the quality of the loan, very low loss rates. They kept the mortgages on their books, and suddenly, there's 8% mortgages, and they were financing them with 13% C, C certificates of deposit. And many of the savings and loans failed. The ones that made it through that hurdle got some help from their regulator. The regulator was called the FSLIC. It's now the <laughs> FDIC. And what they did is they gave them first, they forced them to hedge their mortgage portfolios. This is a little esoteric, but you can't hedge a mortgage portfolio because people, there are no prepayment penalties on mortgages. So when interest rates started falling, they lost billions of dollars in the hedge position. And then they got the advice to get into the commercial real estate business because they, they couldn't make any money in the residential real estate business, right? 1990, we had a commercial real estate bust, and, and most of the rest of the savings and loans failed. That's when Freddie and Mac and Fannie Mae took over the home mortgage business. Now, what was interesting, there were people like BB&T that would have been very interested in filling that gap. But we, just, we decided not to enter that business because we couldn't compete against the federal government. Remember, Freddie and Fannie had a government guarantee. Their leverage is 1,001. They had the lowest cost of capital. They crowded everybody out of, the pri out of what's called the prime mortgage business. Nobody could compete against them. Interesting enough, I don't have much empathy for Golden West, but you know why Golden West got in the pick a payment mortgage business? They couldn't compete against the federal government. They were, they were forced out of the prime business by Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And, and then, of course, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae got pressure from Congress uh, to get out of the prime business and get into the subprime business, and that's when they really focus on so-called the broker origination business, where somebody originates a mortgage and sells it. It led to a lot of fraud because when you originate a mortgage and you hold it, you care about the quality. When you originate and sell it, if you can find some fool to buy it, you want to try to do that. Uh, and then, unfortunately, the big rating agencies, which have a special government sanction, by the way, from the SEC, Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch, misrated a lot of these instruments, and they got sold into the capital markets. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> I think we've made a series of pretty big mistakes since all this started. The first mistake is not letting firms fail. In a uh, free market, we need for corrections to take place. One reason the residential real estate market has not bottomed is we haven't let it bottom. We'd actually been better letting it clear and the market move forward. On a concrete basis, uh, uh, we've saved firms that were very economically damaging. One of the interesting examples is a company called GMAC. They've got a, a new name now, but they were the finance arm of General Motors. They were one of the major causes of the problems in the automobile industry because they invented the seven-year 100% car loan. Well, the problem with that is after three years, everybody owned more than a car than it was worth, and, and they couldn't pay back the cars, but they're doing the same thing today. There's plenty of finance in the car business, just the rest of us won't do that kind of stuff. Citigroup, in my, in my career, has been saved three times. Each time that they've gotten bigger and worse. I guarantee you they'll get bigger and worse, as is certain. Um, Interesting long-term implications of bailouts. If probably a few of you remember, 30 years ago, uh, we saved Chrysler, the automobile, and people called that a good thing. Here's an interesting question. We're saving Chrysler again. What if Chrysler had failed 30 years ago? Would the unions have learned a lesson? I think so. 
Well, did the management of Ford and General Motors learn a lesson? Maybe there had been a, a, a non-unionized automobile manufacturer in the United States. I would say with almost certainty that we had had a more viable automobile industry if we'd had the discipline of letting Chrysler fail a long time ago. Letting not letting companies fail is destructive in the long term. The other interesting thing is <clears throat> the choice to, to incent the economy to spend a lot of money we don't have on things that don't need to be done. Now, intuitively, that doesn't sound like a good idea, right? You lose your job and you increase your spending. Your company's revenues fall and you increase your expenses. Not an intuitively good idea. It's based on a theory by John Maynard Keynes. He wrote a book called The General Theory. You ought to read that book. It's an interesting book. Uh, when it is, in his book, he argues that in, in adverse times, you ought to pay people to dig holes in the ground and then pay people to fill them back up. I do not believe you can ra raise your standard of living paying people to dig holes in the ground and paying people to fill them back up. If you want to incent activity, cut taxes and give money to the people that know how to use it productively. Give money that they have high incomes because they're productive. Give money to people that create jobs. Uh, we've also had massive increases in regulation. That's twofold. New laws passed, but if you're in a business, all the regulators are energized. And that's reducing economic activity. More regulations do not raise economic activity. In addition, we've created a huge amount of ambiguity, and it was referred to uh, one of the, I teach leadership, and one of the things I, <clears throat> I've learned in leadership, whenever a human system is headed in the wrong direction, the worst thing you can do is, in, is increase the uncertainty. Because under ambiguous, ambiguous situations, people become afraid, and they become, they assume the worst case. You had a 2,000-page health care bill that nobody knows what it means, a 2,000-page finance bill, nobody knows what that means. That means people become more cautious. And small business, instead of opening two locations, maybe open one location or no location. That kind of ambiguity is very economically destructive. I would argue this, though. As interesting as the economic issues are, I think the financial crisis is primarily caused by philosophical issues. I think the philosophical issues are far more fundamental and far more long-term. The primary cause of the financial crisis is the combination of altruism and pragmatism. Where did affordable housing come by? from. Everybody has a right to a house provided by who? Everybody has a right to free medical care provided by who? My right to free medical care is my right to enslave a doctor to provide me with that medical care or to enslave somebody else to pay that doctor to provide me with that medical care. That is an exact inversion of the American concept of rights. In the American concept of rights, each of us has the right to what we produce what we create, not what somebody else produces, not what somebody else creates. That altruistic morality leads to a redistribution from the productive to the non-productive, and it basically says nobody has a right to their own life. And then we, can, we combine altruism with pragmatism, and the reason we, we do that is in business you can't be an altruist, because you can't stay in business being an altruist. So business people's back up positions, they become pragmatists. And the rule in pragmatism is do what works. Here's the unfortunate reality. A lot of things work in the short term that are very destructive in the long term. Pick a payment mortgages worked for years and then did huge economic damage. The interesting thing about pragmatists, too, is they can't be rational because rationality requires a long-term perspective. They can't have integrity. There's not surprising there's a lack of integrity in the business community because integrity recall, requires a long-term perspective. You combine altruism with pragmatism, you get what I'll call the free lunch mentality. Um, think about the last presidential election. Neither candidate proposed any meaningful solution to Social Security and Medicare where we have massive deficits. And if they had, they would not have been elected, right? That free lunch <coughs> mentality leads to a lack of personal responsibility. And a lack of personal responsibility is the death of democracies. Uh, the Founding Fathers talked about the tyranny of the majority, and they were talking really about the abuse of individual rights, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But what they recognize is when 51% of the people figure out they can vote a free lunch for 49%, pretty soon it's 60% want a free lunch for 40%, and then 70% want a free lunch for 30%, and the 30% quit. The cause is, is, is philosophical, so is the cure. And the cure is expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each individual's moral right to their own life. Each individual's moral right to the product of their own labor, including if they produce a lot, including the right to give it away to who they want to on whatever terms they want to. That moral prerogative demands personal responsibility because there is no free lunch. It demands and rewards rationality. It demands and rewards self-discipline. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When most people hear that, they think about liberty, and liberty is very important. 
But liberty is an old idea. The world-changing idea was the pursuit of happiness. Before Thomas Jefferson, before the thinkers of the Enlightenment, everybody existed for somebody else's good. Good of the king, good of the state, good of the church. What Jefferson said is each one of us has the moral right to our own life. We're not guaranteed success in that pursuit, but we have that, that right. That was the world-changing idea. That created not only the most uh, successful society in history, but it created the most benevolent society. When people have the right to their own life, they're naturally nicer to other people. And if you think about it, the United States was the first country ever founded on the idea that people should act in their rational self-interest properly understood. Not taking advantage of other people, but not self-sacrificing either. In the context of what I call the trader principle. In our business, we try to help our clients be economically successful. They let us make a profit doing it. We get better together. In fact, life is about creating win-win relationships, and that is a proper moral principle for a free society. Um, my favorite book by far uh, is, is Atlas Rug, written by Ayn Rand in 1957. Uh, Rand wrote the book, she said, to keep her prediction from coming true. Unfortunately, it is coming true. Uh, if you haven't read Atlas Rugged, you really ought to read it. If you haven't read it, read it recently, you ought to uh, read it because it really is in in interesting in terms of reflecting on what's happening, happening today. Where do we go from here? Um, yeah, I mean, and we still, for all these challenges, we have a fundamentally sound economic system in, in, in its core, and, but it's a very challenged system. And if I look at the intermediate period of time, I think we are going to have some kind of economic recovery. But unfortunately, I think that the most likely scenario, three or four or five years down the road, is stagflation. Looks a lot like the 1970s, some real growth, but slow growth, uh, higher inflation, higher unemployment than this necessary. Not terrible, but not really good times. What really scares me is 20, 25 years down the road. And we have an economic disaster potential if we continue to go where we're going. If we continue to have altruistic, pragmatic, free lunch mentality, we've got some really whopping economic challenges. We have huge unfunded uh, deficits in Social Security, even bigger in Medicare. Obamacare creates another huge unfunded deficit. Um, we have a large number of unfunded public pension plans across much of the United States. The totality in all those programs is probably as much as $50 trillion in unfunded liabilities we have in those programs. We're running trillion dollar plus operating deficits. We have a dysfunctional foreign policy. We have a big problem with the retirement of the baby boomer generations. And we have a failed K-12 through education system based on the statistics. Pretty whopping challenges. If we don't change direction, 20, 25 years from now, the United States will go bankrupt. Now, countries don't go bankrupt like companies do. What they typically do is they hyperinflate, they print a lot of money, or they become third world economies like Argentina. You know, in 1940, Argentina had a higher standard of living than the United States. Uh, if we don't change direction, Argentina may have a higher standard of living than the United States if, if we don't change direction. Now, here's the good news. I'm not in the pessimistic category that says we can't change direction. In fact, what we have to do is fairly simple. We have to go back to the principles that made us great in the first place. Right for everything, the pursuit of happiness, individual rights, free markets, less government, less interference in our lives. It's kind of a simple idea, hard to, hard to execute. What gives me some op uh, op optimism is what I call the American sense of life. Americans fundamentally are skeptical of big government, and, and, and I think that is a certain kind of protection. I want to also uh, share with you a challenge, and, and one reason I like to talk to groups like this is because you are leaders uh, in our society in one way or the other, and, and among all of our challenges has been a failure of leadership. A failure of leadership in particular to act on principle, and we need principled action. I think the right kind of principles for an individual are the same kind of principles that are right for a business, that are the same kind of principles that are right for a society. At bb t we have 10 core values, and underlying those values are what I think are the three great virtues. The three great virtues. Purpose, reason, and self-esteem. As human beings, we are purpose-directed entities. We have to know where we're going in order to get there. Businesses, civic organizations, uni universities, any kind of organization is simply a group of human beings. For an organization to be successful, the people in that organization need to vest in the purpose of the organization. You know, it's interesting to me, while the content of purpose will vary, I would argue the context is the same for everybody in this room. I believe that context has two fundamental components. 
The first component is I believe that every person in this room wants to make the world a better place to live. I don't believe you'd be here today if you didn't want to do that. And I think that's a characteristic of the vast majority of human beings. Now, the interesting thing is you don't have to go to Africa and feed hungry children to make the world a better place to live. There are lots of ways to do that. Businesses make the world a better place to live. Businesses provide high-quality products, high-quality services that improve the quality of life. In fact, the primary difference between the quality of life in the United States and the quality of life in Africa is we have better businesses. When business leaders forget they're in business to make the world a better place to live, bad things happen to those kind of businesses. Good doctors, good teachers, good homemakers make the world a better place to live. There are lots of ways to make the world a better place to live. And I do believe that that is a fundamental need, a fundamental sense of purpose out of making the world a better place to live. The second component of purpose, however, is equally important and way under-discussed. Way under-discussed. You need to make the world a better place to live doing something you want to do for you. Your children need to make the world a better place to live doing something they want to do for themselves. Each of you has the moral right to your own life. If you were to make the world a better place to live and you didn't enjoy doing it, you will have wasted the most precious thing you have, which is you. And by the way, if you try to make the world a better place to live <clears throat> doing something you don't want to do, the odds are you won't do it very well. So you need a sense of purpose, making the world a better place to live, doing something you want to do for you. The means by which we accomplish our purpose is our capacity to think. We use the term reason. Everything that's alive has a method of staying alive. A lion has claws to hunt with, a deer has speed to avoid the hunter, and we have the capacity to think. And our capacity to think is literally our only means of survival, success, and happiness. There are no shortcuts, there are no free lunches. There are two critical institutional pillars that make human minds productive. The first pillar is freedom. In order to be innovative, in order to be creative, in order to, to contribute to human progress, in order to think, you have to be free to think. So freedom is not just the primary, it reflects the nature of us as human beings, as independent thinking entities. People in academic environment, in an academic environment, they get that, they believe in academic freedom. But they somehow think that business people can think with this huge set of government rules and regulations that literally prevents you from thinking. In my career, I've seen a dozen opportunities that we could have provided better client service, better products to meet the needs of our clients, and it was against some kind of rule, some kind of regulation everywhere. When you prevent people from thinking, they cannot be innovative, they cannot be creative. And that's literally what government rules and regulations do. The second institutional pillar is that in order to be productive as a human being, we have to know how to do something. So knowledge is the foundation of productivity. And knowledge comes from education in the broadest context. So the quality of our education institutions ultimately drives the quality of our life. We cannot afford to have a failed K through education system. In the United States, almost a third of the students do not graduate from high school in a world where you need a far better education than that. Our public schools have failed by any kind of objective standard. I've been involved trying to fix public schools for 50 years, and I'm convinced it's hopeless. I do not believe that you can impact the public school system. What we really need in education is competition. You know, in business, we like to talk about being innovative, but we hate to innovate, really. We're forced to innovate. Competition forces us to innovate. Um, so we need to subsidize the students and not subsidize the schools. And we need to create competition in the education arena. And, and, and when people think about that, they see current private schools. I think the model would be very different than that. What we really need is 100,000 experiments. It, it, just like small businesses. Small businesses are experiments and most of them fail. And if we had 100,000 educational experiments, most of them would fail. But we would have some huge breakthroughs. There's a Bill Gates out there, there's a Sam Walton, there's a Thomas Edison out there who would revolutionize education. And we can't afford to have a failed K through education system. Interesting thing, when you're clear about your purpose and when you use your thinking capacity to accomplish your purpose, you get to do something very important. You get to raise your self-esteem. You know, what I see at higher levels in organizations, um, people almost never fail, groups like this, people don't fail because they aren't smart enough. They, aren't, they don't fail because they aren't well educated enough. If they do fail, it's classically because they have some subconscious low self-esteem issue that results in self-destructive behavior. Uh, in addition, self-esteem is the foundation for happiness, and happiness is the end of the game, right? And I don't mean having a good time on Friday night, but I mean having a life well lived, hard earned. Happiness. Happiness in the Aristotelian sense. That's the end of the game, right? Sometimes people in business get confused. They think money's the end of the game. Nothing wrong with money. Money's a really good thing. But money is not an end. It can be a means to an end. It's not an end. Happiness is the end. To be happy, you have to have a high level of self-esteem. 
A couple thoughts about self-esteem. It's actually a very complex subject, but a couple thoughts. First, self-esteem is earned. It's fundamentally self-confidence in your ability to live and be successful given the facts of reality. So you earn self-esteem by how you live your life. Nobody can give you self-esteem. You cannot give your children self-esteem. Promoting children that have not mastered a grade lowers their self-esteem. Self-esteem is earned. Second thought about self-esteem, for probably everybody in this room and for the vast majority of self-esteem, for the vast majority of people, the primary single biggest driver of self-esteem is your work. And I use work in the broadest context, raising children is very hard, very productive work. Work is the single biggest driver of self-esteem because you spend most of your time, effort, and energy at work. Something I say to all the employees of bb and it's real important to bb and that you do your job well, but it's far, far, far more important to you. You might fool me about how well you do your job, you might fool your boss about how well you do your job, but you'll never fool you. If you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, give me your level of skill, give me your level of knowledge, you can't do the impossible. If you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, you will lower your self-esteem. Now here's the good news, the flip's also true. Do your work the best you can possibly do it, give them your level of skill, give them your level of knowledge, and you will raise your self-esteem, which is more important than whether you get a promotion or you get more money because it's about who you are as an individual. That concept is applicable in general to society. Take an entry-level construction worker, a bricklayer. Man has a tough life, works hard, barely makes a living, but it makes a living. Raises his children, maybe his granddaughter becomes CEO of a publicly traded company, maybe not. That individual may have a tough life in a physical sense, but he earns something really important spiritually from his work. He gets to be proud of himself. He gets self-esteem from his work. Take that same bricklayer, give him welfare. He may be better off financially, but he loses something precious. He loses pride in himself. He loses his self-esteem. There's a lot of conversation today about security, and, and we as a country are certainly legitimately worried about security, but this is not the land of security. This is the land of opportunity. People didn't get on a boat and come to Jamestown to be secure. This is the land of opportunity, the opportunity to be great, the opportunity to fail and try again, but most importantly, the opportunity of that bricklayer to live life on his own terms. That is the American sense of life, and that is what's so precious for us to protect. Thank you very much. Take a few questions.